So, um, thought if I made it big enough, it would make it. get rid of that thing on the side, but apparently not. All right, you can't have everything. All right, so these are, this is hardware information about what you need for forensics. There's an American Society of Crime Laboratory Directors that helps to find standards. There's a lot of sources of standards. There's the international standard, there's the scientific working group on digital evidence, and so on. And there's a lot of private labs. Like I've mentioned, there's drive savers. Uh, yeah, I don't have a longer cable. You might want to move over. Anyway, um, drive savers is one place that will privately do uh, forensic work and data recovery work, which are very similar activities. And uh, let me turn this thing. Oops, that's in the way. Huh. Anyway. Uh, all right. So uh, e-discovery, I mentioned before a lot. This is one of the big applications of computer forensic techniques is to gather evidence for a lawsuit. Um, it's a big deal. The news is all full of the discovery for Donald Trump that just happened. They just dumped him all the evidence they had from all the grand jury testimony, everything else, and you have to do that. If you're the prosecutor, you do investigation and you get a bunch of evidence, and then you have to give all that evidence to the other side so they can prepare a defense. And if you don't, the judge tends to rule summarily against you. So it's really bad to do a bad job of e-discovery, and it can be very difficult. You might often have to go back seven years and find all the emails and PDFs and everything else, and often people's computer networks are a mess, and it's hard to find all that stuff. So a plaintiff is the person making a claim against somebody, and the defendant is the other side. Sarbanes Oxley requires companies to maintain all electronic information. And you also have to retain it if a lawsuit is coming. Uh, and I think this might be the one that was in response to Enron. Enron was a famous fraud case. It was a Texas energy company that manipulated the energy market and stole half of the entire GDP of California to Texas, which we never got back because our governor, Gray Davis, had signed an agreement to buy energy paying a floating price that could float to any, any high number. So we were legally obligated to pay that. But anyway, their, um, their accountant was Arthur Anderson, and they deleted all the data before the lawsuit. And after that, they passed rules saying you can't be doing that. You can't delete data. So evidence acquisition is the main thing you think of for a forensic lab where you gather evidence from devices. And what you're really trying to do is preserve the evidence. You get all the evidence, you make a file like a E01 image, and then you can analyze that and you can make copies of it, one for the plaintiff and one for the defense. And you take the original computer or drive or phone or whatever and you lock it in a safe because that's best evidence. The copies are good enough for an analysis and presenting testimony from your expert witnesses, but best evidence is this is the computer they used to commit the crime. It's like taking the gun into court. This is the real gun. That's best evidence when you have the real object that was used in the crime. So email is, of course, important. And if you do, after a while, you will have a large inventory of important stuff in a safe or a locked room, and you have to, of course, have tags on it and records so you can keep track of it all and not lose it. Um, and one mistake beginning forensic analysts, uh, forensic investigators often do is they forget to charge their client for storage because at first it's not a problem and before long you're overwhelmed with stuff and you have to pay for more and more expensive places to put it and also you don't know how long you have to keep it so charging your client for storage is one way to keep that under some control. Um, all right. And of course you often have to have web hosting and a lot of good computers. So here's a small laboratory you might have, some cabinets for all your equipment, and an evidence locker that's probably locked better than that one, and a couple of workstations, and a workbench for taking things apart, and so on. Uh, your workstations usually have to be very powerful. You want them to have lots of fast I.O. ports like uh, external SATA. You need a ton of big removable hard drives, and you want them to have as much processing power as possible because you're gonna to have to make these huge images and then you're gonna to have to run forensic software like um, autopsy that will have to examine those huge images. And if your machine is not powerful, it will take many hours to gather evidence and many hours to analyze it. All right, um, and for mobile devices, you need a whole bunch of special tools. You need special tools to take them apart. You need special tools to connect to them to get the evidence off, hardware and software. It, um, Celebrite and other companies will sell you a kit it's like a whole suitcase full of gadgets for like $10,000 with 
hundreds of connectors for all the different cell phones that are out there. Uh, this is what the police have to do. Um, companies typically don't because they'll have like one corporate standard device for your company phone and they won't need to handle other phones, although these days they might. But realistically, if I was a private company, I would just say, let's just outsource that to drive savers. If it comes up that we have to examine anything that isn't just an ordinary thing like a modern Android or a modern iPhone. Um, but it's an issue. Let me check here. Good, okay. Just checking to see if there are questions. All right, so here's some things you might have. Celebrite is probably a gold standard. Um, that's a device. Celebrite claims they can image, get data off any device, even a locked iPhone without the pin. Um, gray key is a law enforcement device that will try pins until it breaks in. So it can defeat pins at least on the older phones. I'm not sure if it can do the newest phones, but I'm sure they're constantly updating it. Um, and there's other devices here, uh, like Parabin. Parabin makes these bags to store your, your phone in, Faraday bags, so they can't communicate with wireless networks. And Oxygen and Black Bag make more devices, particularly for Mac. Um, so if you got a field storage unit, which is what you might do if you have to gather evidence on the scene. Now the best thing, of course, is just you put up that yellow tape, you photograph the scene, the, you make sure you've got the original records of where everything is, and then you just take everything back to the lab. That's the easiest thing. But if for some reason you can't do that, then you have to actually gather evidence at the scene, and then you need some portable stuff that can do this. So hard drives that have been erased, that's sanitized, a powerful laptop, a Celebrite device or something else that can connect to the iPhones and other phones you find, Faraday bags, more and more external storage devices, and uh, some software to do all this. X-Way, x, -way, x software, so does Encase, so does FTK, a lot of people do. And forms, you'll need a chain of custody form and other ones like uh, consent for search, I think, and tools to open up things and label things. So it's all pretty obvious. All of this is pretty straightforward from watching TV cop shows, but you know, it's, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the stuff you need. So a Faraday box is a box covered with metal so radio, uh, radio waves cannot get in or out. And a Faraday room is a room covered with wire mesh all the way around so radio can't get in or out to make a uh, radio dead zone. And both of those are good to analyze devices with wireless connectivity like phones. And of course, you need to have an evidence locker because you have to go to court and you have to testify there's an evidence chain of custody form. And I signed, and at this time, on this date, I took possession of the evidence and I locked it up and made sure nobody messed with it until I brought it right here. That's what you're testifying to in court. I didn't just take it and leave it lying around. I locked it up somewhere good. And I'm willing to testify in court that I took good precautions so nobody messed with it. If you don't do that, you have a broken chain of custody and it becomes almost worthless in court because it's possible that somebody tampered with it and therefore the evidence on it is not reliable. So you need cabinets in some kind of locked room or a safe. Then you need to duplicate drives and there's hardware devices just to duplicate drives. That's one way to do it. You can also do it with uh, software. Um, now you also, one thing you need is a write blocker. You need a hardware write blocker all the time. You, there are many different ways to image a drive, but what you must do is make sure you're not modifying it while you're imaging it. If you don't do that, then you can be altering the evidence while you're collecting it. And while that is sometimes necessary for something like a live acquisition, if you're doing that on just a seized computer that comes in with the power off and you, and you don't use a write blocker, you will be criticized heavily as an incompetent investigator. That is the standard of the business. You are supposed to use a write blocker so things you get with the power off, you get a 100% perfect copy of them. And it costs like 300 bucks, but you have to buy one of these write blockers. There are several different brands. Then there's SIM card readers and um, drives to put your data on. Make sure you've erased them first so there's no other data on that drive other than what you're copying from the evidence. And of course, lots of tools to open all those cases and uh, remove the hard drives and things like that. Flashlights digital cameras to record things like serial numbers and the layout of cables and such. You always take pictures of the whole scene, including all the cables and all the gadgets before you move anything so you can later reconnect it as needed. And uh, if there's something like a password written down somewhere, you'll know where it was near and things like that. 
And these evidence bags are just there to prevent tampering. Some of them are just paper. The point is not to prevent people from getting in. The point is to make it obvious if somebody got in. So you seal it, and then you, if it's still sealed at the other end, you know nobody was in there in the meantime. Although, there are ways to overcome that. In fact, uh, Dark Tangent, the leader of DEF CON, um, Jeff Moss, started a tamper evident village and tamper evident contest at DEF CON where people open these supposedly tamper evident things without leaving a trace. And they have all these cool techniques like you get an eyedropper or a syringe with like alcohol and you slowly dissolve the glue and open it and then put it back. You know, as you can imagine, this is not perfect. You could get in there. That's true of every security measure. You know, you can pick locks, you know, you can get into safes, you know, nothing is ever perfect. All right. And then you've got a bitstream imaging software that will just take a complete copy of data. Um, Sleuth Kitten Autopsy is what we're using. There's X-Ways, F-Response, Paladin, and Case, Blacklight. There's a lot of different brands of this stuff that will collect data, and then many of it will analyze data like Autopsy 2. Virtual machines are often quite useful. For example, you might seize a computer and get an image, and it might have some weird thing on it like WordPerfect from 30 years ago. And you can't open those files, so the easiest way to do it is take your image and boot it in a virtual machine and use the WordPerfect installed on there to open it to see what's in there. That's the thing you would do if you hit some weird program and you don't have any way to examine it with modern programs, because there's a whole lot of computer software from decades ago that has been abandoned. All right, and then we mentioned before, photographs have metadata, and many cameras by default will put in the date and time and GPS location and the owner's name, so if they're doing that, that's very handy. Uh, and photo evidence, you, as you've seen, you can see the photos in autopsy. Photos are very important because they're very easy to explain to a jury. If you have a picture, proving that somebody did the bad thing, that's much more convincing than something like a log file where you have to see some numbers and code numbers on a text and explain. People can easily understand what a picture means. All right. And there are, bare, there are some software like Adroit Forensics that can reconstruct pictures from the fragments left on the drive. Um, that tends to be the um, simple tools like Encase and I think Autopsy <coughs> will just find where a picture starts and find where it stops and assume everything in between is in the picture. But that's not always true. If your drive starts to get full, you might have a fragmented image where part of it's stored in one place and part in another and part in another. And in that case, a simple recovery process will get you a messed up image with zones of garbage in the middle of the image. And there are software packages you can buy that will do a smarter job of reconstructing the image. But in practice, most people don't care enough. You don't really need usually to get every image. Usually getting most of the images is enough. But there's one of the products that can do a better job. Uh, you'll need a lot of power. Those powerful computers will draw a lot of power, so you have to have enough. You've got to have fire extinguishers, of course. And it's expensive. That's why you charge a lot of money to do forensic works. So I remember it must be 10 years ago when I took one of my classes. He said, you charge $800 an hour for imaging a drive, for acquiring evidence. And it's all like that. because. You pay a lot of money for these things, and that's the way it is. Um, all right, and then you've got to restrict who has access to your lab. Of course, you can't have people wandering into your lab where you're examining things. You have to have a log of who goes in. The best thing would be a card reader or something. You have to be able to testify, like I said, that I know nobody went into my lab and modified stuff. Uh, that's, again, kind of obvious, but you have to do it. Uh, that's physical security. And you should have a, like you say, a sign-in sheet or something so you record who went in so you can say, I know that nobody went in and messed with my stuff. Nobody went in there but my authorized people. And by the way, as your practice grows, you have to train your staff and develop standard procedures, like a checklist that they go through. You want to always follow the standard procedures as much as possible because that's best easiest to defend. And uh, there are official recommendations of standard procedures like erase all the drives first, make a complete image, verify the hash value, store it in a safe, that sort of thing. And it's best if all your staff is trained in the standard procedures. That's why most of the cop shows are police procedurals. There are rules, like when you go to a scene, you put that tape up and get everybody out of there right away, no matter what it is. Then you write down everybody's name and phone number in case you need to call them later. There's just standard things you always do. Even if you show up and it seems extremely obvious what happened, 
and you think you don't need to ask anybody anything, you do take pictures and get all their names and addresses because just following the same procedures every time is the best thing to do because then if something goes wrong, you have that to fall back on. And anyway, um, so you extract your evidence. Uh, Linux is often used with DD and a variety of things like this that can copy data. Um, and there's some information in this doc, this textbook where you get information about how bank numbers and credit card numbers are formed. I certainly don't have to memorize this or anything, but, but the credit card numbers have a pattern that tell you which company's credit card it is. And the uh, same thing's true of the check numbers, those bank, bank routing numbers and such. And another thing to be aware of, which Brian Krebs has been writing blogs about for years, a journalist, is these skimmers. You can buy them online. They make skimmers that look exactly like the face of your ATM machine. And they secretly send the data somewhere else, like recorded on a USB stick, or they send it through wireless to a nearby device. And they also come with cameras that record you typing in the pin. And these are extremely effective. I remember about eight years ago, a bunch of um, gas stations in Nevada, people actually opened the gas station pump and put the skimmer inside so there's nothing you could see. And every time you put in a credit card, it was sending that to someone nearby. I'm thinking they must have come in the middle of the night when it was shut, or perhaps bribed the attendant to look the other way. But I mean, that's pretty ruthless. Usually it's an outside thing like this, and you can tell by sort of yanking and poking at it before you put your card in. But um, so I never use those little cheap ATM things they have in like convenience stores. I use the official bank one, which is a little better, I think. Because for one thing, it's inside a room and they record who goes in that room after hours. So I think it's less likely to be hit with a skimmer. Anyway, um, they make a bunch, a bunch of them. And then uh, for some reason they put steganography here, which is an interesting thing. I'm not quite sure how it relates to this chapter. Steganography is hiding data in a file. So you can have a movie and you can have a second image hidden in the movie or a Word document hidden in the movie by just what you do is you take the colors and you change the color just a little bit. So you have a few bits of the color that have been changed, and you pick those bits out and form the other files. So you can hide a small file inside a big file. That's called steganography. And it's a covert channel. It's a way to move data without anybody knowing it's out there. Terrorists use this. They will tell like their cell that your instructions are in like the fourth gray cat on Instagram at this page. And when you go to that, there's just a picture of a cat, but you run it through the right tool and it picks out the certain bits that are encoding bits and now they're getting a secret message. And the point is, you don't even, it's not like an email. You don't know who you sent that to. You don't even know that a message was sent. There was just something posted somewhere and somebody looked at it and found a secret in it. Um, the Anna Chapman, the Russian spy about 10 years ago that was in Washington DC seducing generals and politicians, had a steganography program. That's how she was communicating back home. And they found out because when she fled, she left her computer behind because they were onto her and they were arresting her and she fled back to Russia and they got her computer program. In principle, steganography would be almost impossible to detect. Uh, the only real way to detect it is if you have an image that's been altered and you find the original image and then you compare them bit for bit. Then you'd have some clue. But in principle, you could have any pattern of bits hiding the data and uh, there's no need for it to follow any pattern. There are some standard tools they mentioned, like Steg Detect and Stegify and Stego Watch that will detect if they use standard software for steganography, but there's no reason not to just write your own. It's not that complicated. I was just teaching it yesterday in a class in Python. Read a file bit for bit and write it bit for bit is easy, and you could just change some of the bits. And you could have some weird pattern of the bits, like a Fibonacci pattern or something that people aren't going to guess, and then I don't know how you'd ever figure it out unless you can find the unaltered image. And even then, you might not know what the bits mean. So anyway, that's steganography. Let me take a look and see if there are questions in the Twitch. Um, there's an issue with the right side of the screen cutting off. Uh, you're right. It looks like the right little bit of the screen is cut off. Okay, let me um, just make my window a little smaller. It's the simplest answer for that. All right. And I think a little less, good. Yeah, all right, that's pretty good. Thank you for telling me. And now let's do the uh, the, the cahoots. I've been forgetting these. Yeah. So I have a question about people like working these labs. Yeah. Do you have like access to like a lawyer and like sitting right next to them or like a detective or? Well, uh, you're, everybody, lawyers are important. 
Um, but a typically a forensic person will, you're working with lawyers. Lawyers are who hires you um, if you're on defense. And then you communicate with them. You often don't have your own lawyer, although you probably might need one occasionally. Um, and of course, if you're working for the police, they have their own legal team and such. Uh, but no, you don't normally talk to them that often. I mean, it's pretty routine. I used to do essentially this kind of work, um, although, and you would get a, you just get requests from our clients who were lawyers. You'd get documents, you'd read them and do stuff, and then you'd just have meetings with them like once a week or as needed for progress and stuff. But normally what you're doing is not controversial. You know, they, you get the evidence now, okay, analyze the evidence, and then tell us the answer. You only call them when you have a question or they have a question. So you basically have carte blanche to do whatever it takes to get the information that you need? Well, you, you have to know the rules. I mean, if you, if you have, um, of course, you have to just do competent examination, and they're trusting you to know what that is. So um, when I did it, I would get evidence that was impounded by the Federal Trade Commission. I mean, sometimes they just got a stack of floppy disks that they impounded from a company where they had seized their stuff, and they sent it to me, and I would just get the data off of there, assemble it in our standard format, and then tell them what I found. I found this many records, this many total dollars. Um, so, I mean, they trust you. It's, you're like a, it's not like a wet forensic or any other scientist. They're trusting you to do the technical part. And they're doing the legal part. So they have the court order and the lawsuit, and they seize the data. Then they ship it to you for analysis. And they just expect you're going to do a standard amount of analysis. And then if some kind of question comes up, then you communicate with them. But normally, it's a pretty routine activity. I mean, all you're going to do is whatever kind of evidence come in, you're going to make a copy of it. You're going to lock up the original thing. And then you're going to analyze it to see what's on there. Are you also going to be at the scene of the crime? Well, no, that's a different activity. That's why typically the people who go into the scene of the crime are the first responders, and they're often not trained forensic people. That's why Microsoft made a tool called Coffee, which was for cops. It was intended to make it easy for an untrained person to image a machine. Cause, and that's, those people often don't know much about forensics. They just learn how to copy a hard drive. And that's what they do at the scene. And then they take it back and hand it to the evidence people. So your main forensic examiners don't go to the crime scene. They don't have a gun. They're in the lab. They get the stuff which is seized by other people. How often do the first responders like screw up and accidentally? Well, I, I don't have experience with that directly, but I think everybody screws up a lot at every level in the private sector and the public sector. Very often evidence gets lost. Very often forensic analysis is bad, you know, just Murphy's Law. <laughs> and also, one thing particular to law enforcement, there's a lot of enormous scandals of forensic examiners that fake the results to please the cops. That happened over and over. There was a guy in Pennsylvania that faked his DNA results for like 15 years. He just always told the cops it was who they wanted it to be. And when they started hiring other people to help him, he would try and make sure they didn't see what he was doing. And they finally noticed that he wasn't doing a good job at all. He wasn't labeling the vials correctly. He wasn't analyzing them correctly. He was just filling out the forms. And they turned him in, and now they had to go through hundreds of old cases of people that had been wrongly convicted. This has happened, like, many times. And um, that's a problem. That's why you need two French examiners. You need one on prosecution and one on defense. The prosecution will say, I found this stuff, and your defense needs their own examiner to examine it and see if it's true. And you can do that at least in computer work. I don't know about the blood forensics and stuff. I'm not sure if you get to have your own examiner and that kind of thing. But, but this is a problem. Um, so every kind of mistake and corruption will happen to some extent. It's a, that's the problem. A very good question. Anyway, let's try this. Yeah. What's that? Oh, yes. Every police department has a forensic lab. And I've been to tour the one in San Jose. It's very nice. They have a lab with these examiners, and they just have this whole wall of tools and gadgets. And, you know, they've got a, a computer lab like you find at, say, the, uh, the Genius Bar at Apple, where they've got all the tools you need to fix Max. They've just got a whole computer lab full of all the gadgets they need to investigate stuff. And you can get tours now and then. Um, one of the other teachers here, Sandy Jones, she has good relations with them, and she takes her forensic class into Turum. I don't have that kind of contact, but um, they do that now and then. Hey, you can see it. And it really just looks like any other tech lab. Bunch of computers, bunch of workbenches. But what they're doing is forensic analysis instead of computer repair. But it's a very similar activity. Good. Anyway, uh, let me find my cahoots for this, which are 
this is scene at 121. Oh, I gotta go favorites, that's what. And it's, uh, I think I have to shrink it down. There we are, favorites. All right, 121 mod four, that's my plan. There we go. people on Twitch. Might be some more coming in. Get a few more seconds. Maybe we got enough people. All right. Okay. So, which U.S. law requires companies to preserve information? GDPR is European law, and these, I think, are um, Security and Exchange Commission handles things like Bitcoin and such, or at least they want to, and this, I think, is a uh, forensic organization. All right. All right. Which hardware device is only available to law enforcement? Police used to bypass passwords on iPhones. All right, 
Which one do you have to have in your French account? Now you've got to have a right blocker. The rest of these are optional but you must have a right blocker or you can't do a competent job of imaging drives. All right, which Linux tool copies evidence from a drive? DD. Good? Just duplicate. I, I think that's what it stands for. That's what it does anyway. All right. Root. And CF1212. I know who Root is, and I think you might know who CF1212 is, and she has rules. You might have those names from before. I'm not sure. I know Root we have. All right. Good. I'm going to stop this video, make a separate video of the next module.